a number of papers and book chapters on trade and investment, competition policy and regional economic integration among others. A holder of a PhD in economics from the UP School of Economics, she was also a postdoctoral fellow at Yale University. Friends, let's welcome with a warm round of applause, Dr. Erlinda M. Medalia. Of 
So it's not just a, uh, the Asia Study Center here, but all the Asia Study Centers in APEC uh, meet uh, once a year for a consortium. Something similar to Israel Pagoda, so a symposium on a so, uh, chosen APEC topic. And these are the members of the institute, uh, the AIM, Ateneo de Manila, Central La Salle uh, State University, De La Salle, FSI, um, Mindanao State University. The lead com uh, agency is the PIDS, and this is also where the secretariat is. Siliman University, UAMP, UP University of San Carlos, and Xavier University. So we try to have a presence in not just in Manila, but the outside uh, Manila. Our research program, of course, follows the, the APEC agenda. And um, all the member institutions also independently carry out um, its own APEC-related studies. So we have, uh, uh, aside from the research program, we have the thesis and dissertation assistance program. and uh, and. For this, no, we, we want to extend financial support for students, MA and Bank <coughs> and PhD students, who uh, want to uh, do a thesis on interrelated issues. And this is something we want to do more, especially in the future. And so if you know of anyone who, uh, uh, who would wish to, to, to do their thesis and dissertation in APEC, you could uh, apply for funding support. No? from uh, APEC Study Center. Um, we also have technical assistance program and we want to do, we want to provide technical assistance to government. And this is more both in terms of the research we undertake and also to, by, 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 by uh, being uh, present in meetings and, 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 and uh, giving advice no, to, to uh, government directly. So, and then we are a member of the Tech Technical Board on APEC Matters. And we have been a member since uh, the start. And, and then we have the information dissemination and publication program. And this symposium is part of it, this activity. Aside, and then uh, we have an annual symposium, uh, which uh, is an opportunity uh, for the different members to present uh, key studies under a different uh, chosen theme. And um, we have regional presentation of studies uh, in the provinces. So, as I said, this is part of our dissemination program. And, and um, the, the theme, this has been well discussed by previous speakers, and I'm not going to repeat, is really very important. Beyond age ASEAN at 50, opportunities and challenges for integration. And we have two sessions. The first, sessions, the first session uh, is um, by members outside, um, uh, other than the city man. We have, two, we, have, we have one from PIDS and one from uh, DLSU. And the second uh, session is our research studies by city man. Um, the first session um, is um, to be presented by Dr. Sinashad is about ASEAN, what does it mean no? to ASEAN people? And the second is about tech, tech liberty. Um, ASEAN is a huge undertaking. Uh, like um, um, you've heard from uh, Special Assistant Alf Alfred, it covers not just economics, it's also about the uh, <coughs> security and, and the political uh, pillar and also um, social, social, cultural uh, community. So it's not just the AEC. So it's really a huge, huge undertaking. So when you say uh, 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 challenges and opportunities beyond, you know, we can only pick, you know, certain really minute areas of what this means. But I, but hopefully it will give you an idea, you know, already of what what is ASEAN? What does it mean for us? No, what does it mean to um, the man in the street? And, and I think um, the first one tries to get a sense of what that is, no? ASEAN, what ASEAN means to ASEAN people. And tech, tech liberty, of course, this is about innovation. This is something that is um, a very uh, crucial, the, the emerging issue for, not just for the Philippines, but for all of the economies in ASEAN and, and APEC and, and the globe. 
The next session is about um, climate change. Again, no? really uh, uh, something that um, is really very important. Um, uh, a big, big challenge uh, for, for everyone. And, I, and, and I'm glad that, um, and I'm, I know that this is one area of expertise of Siliman. And I'm, re I'm very glad that you know, uh, we have two very uh, good presentations uh, uh, coming soon. So one is on curbing carbon emissions on campus. <laughs> This, uh, this is a uh, corporate the social responsibility. The other one is kinship networks in reducing disaster risk in the collective culture. So I think that gives you an overview of what this symposium is all about. So I think we, I will proceed right away to the first session. Uh, let me uh, uh, give you a brief introduction. No need. So you have the the profiles of the speakers already, and uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, let me give you uh, Sheila. You have 20 minutes, 20 minutes yeah. and uh, who will ring the bell? <laughs> 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 uh, I have a timer, but probably this one. Does that make a sound too? <laughs> Well, uh, good morning everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to apologize for my voice. You have to bear with, with my voice today. Um, but I'll, I'll really try my best to uh, speak clearly. My normal voice, voice isn't like this. It's better, a lot. <laughs> anyway, um, well, as we all know, the ASEAN Summit is over. The delegates have gone back to their respective um, home countries, and for all of us, it's back to normal. For those of us who live in Metro Manila, back to normal means having to uh, deal with the her her uh, horrendous traffic in EDSA uh, daily, okay? But as uh, what um, uh, Mr. B of the DFK has mentioned, well, the ASEAN Summit this year has been uh, very successful, still as productive and very engaging. But um, I think one question that is worth um, answering, is worth knowing is, um, how, how well does ASEAN resonate with ordinary people? What does ASEAN mean to, 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 to ASEAN people, especially for, for Filipinos? And these are questions that I will um, try to um, answer, um, that I will try to answer this morning by presenting to you the results of um, our study by our, I mean Dr. Lian Tong, myself and Dr. Chris Albert, the results of our um, of a study, a survey that we conducted for the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. And uh, the, the survey findings were uh, published um, last August in a volume um, which was um, published by, uh, by a, a series of volumes um, in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of ASEAN. Okay. So this um, public, uh, this is uh, a public perception survey that we conducted in 20, 2016, which means before the ASEAN summit, okay? So in effect, it gives a, a good baseline information on, on the perception of Filipinos about ASEAN, which is useful for future studies, okay? So, as I've said, this was funded by the Economic <coughs> Research Institute of ASEAN and East Asia. It's, in fact, part of a bigger study. So, other surveys um, were also conducted in, uh, in the uh, rest of the member uh, states of the ASEAN. So, its aim is really to determine the level of awareness of Filipinos, of, um, of ASEAN, as well as their aspirations, expectations, and hopes for the association. And we use um, a mixed method approach to uh, um, <coughs> undertake this study. Um, we had um, surveys as well as um, focus group discussions with the youth of um, Botuan City, the business sector of Cebu City, 
and a mixed group um, composed of uh, representatives from government, um, civil society, uh, private sector, I mean business, and um, as well as other um, other sectors using a questionnaire supply by Virginia. However, I'd like to um, mention that this is not the first systematic study on ASEAN awareness. Um, in fact, this is already the third, but uh, the two earlier studies which were conducted in 2014 and 20, uh, in um, 20, 2007 and 2014 by the uh, Singapore-based Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, or ASEAS, dealt uh, mainly with um, young people or university students. So this uh, study that we conducted is more comprehensive because it um, measured the awareness of um, almost all sectors of society. Okay, so it, it provides a more in-depth, more in-depth insights on people's perception about housing. So this is the profile of our survey respondents. We had a total of 289 respondents, um, and the majority of them are from government. Um, we also had uh, old, older respondents, more older respondents from 31 years old and above, and slightly more male respondents. Okay, now let us go to the results. Okay. In terms of awareness of ASEAN, what we found is that it's only moderate familiarity or moderate awareness. And we saw this across groups, across, uh, you know, across sectors. And um, we also found that um, awareness of ASEAN increases with age, meaning older respondents registered greater familiarity or greater, greater awareness of ASEAN than the older respondents. Now, the one I mentioned is solely for the Philippines. How about for other ASEAN member countries? Well, um, the, uh, the slide on the screen is um, that's the data compiled by Iria. And if we look at the data, we can see that um, in most uh, member states of ASEAN, we also registered moderate familiarity of the association. So it's, it was uh, pretty consistent. Okay. Now, in terms of sorts of awareness of um, about ASEAN, um, uh, through the FGDs, no, um, the responses mainly were um, in terms of sources of information. First was school, then um, work and profession, and then last was TV and radio or the media. So. Across um, across the diff across sectors in the FGDs, only a few mentioned the media. Actually, that no media coverage is actually validated in the survey, wherein most of the survey respondents uh, think that the media is not covering the ASEAN very well. Okay. So we also asked the respondents uh, how well they perceive themselves as ASEAN citizens. Well, the, the uh, response was positive. Majority of the survey respondents feel that feel very much that they are ASEAN uh, citizens, and if we um, also um, disaggregate the um, the data by uh, um, age, same with awareness, we found that you know that feeling of being ASEAN, ASEAN citizens increases with age. So older respondents feel more feel very much their, that they are ASEAN citizens compared to older respondents. Um, actually, that um, this can be attributed to the greater awareness of ASEAN as one um, advances in years. Um, most participants in the mixed group also relate that they got to understand what ASEAN is all about through their work. For example, a participant in, uh, from the NGO sector who is a member of the ASEAN Farmers Association said ASEAN is always part of this group's discussion with the Department of Agriculture. Now, this uh, slide here is insi quite insightful. It shows that in terms of the if, in terms of the respondents' perception of the benefits of Philippines uh, membership in, in ASEAN, majority of them feel that um, the Philippines is benefiting from ASEAN only moderately. Okay, um, the largest percentage percentage of those that responded responded posit positively was from the government sector. And the lowest uh, was from the business sector. 
So that EPID response that we got from the business sector is actually worth investigating because this could mean that in the eyes of, the, of um, those from the business sector, um, they are not benefiting much from the ASEAN. Um, the majority of the respondents think that being part of ASEAN is favorable for the Philippines, albeit moderately also coincides with the results of the, of the FGDs. Okay? So, in terms of specific benefits of the Philippines from ASEAN membership, um, you can see the, the summary on the screen. So, looking at uh, the specific reasons, it is apparent that the association is perceived positively in terms of the economic aspect. Probably, uh, um, particularly, I mean, in terms of trade, uh, technology transfer, work opportunities, food security, and uh, there is also some recognition that uh, the asset is important for maintaining peace in the region. Okay, so <clears throat> we also have as uh, there was responding to the question on whether the Philippines should keep its ASEAN membership. Okay? And more respondents, regardless of affiliation, said that they would be extremely concerned if the Philippines were, were to leave ASEAN. And we also uh, gathered the same responses from, um, from the action bees. Um, the reasons given by the, by, the, by the youth in the action bee are quite insightful as well. For them, it's important for the Philippines to keep its ASEAN membership um, for purposes of trade, uh, job creation, as well as um, to, um, to sustain or um, to strengthen our uh, capacity in solving our uh, problems, particularly conflicts and calamities. Okay? Then, um, now to, re to remain relevant, it's important for the ASEAN to be able to uh, meet the needs of, its in of uh, the individual countries in particular and of the region in particular. So we also investigated the respondents' perception and what they think are the most pressing problems on confronting the Philippines now and into 2025, okay? And um, the results actually are um, just as relevant for us in officials to know which issues require urgent attention and need to be prioritized. So using the word cloud, a uh, word cloud, I mean, I summarize the, um, the, uh, the results, no? So the bigger the number, the bigger the word, so the uh, the more uh, responses or uh, the higher was the frequency obtained by the particular uh, issue. So, as you can see on the screen, the, um, the top five most pressing uh, problems uh, mentioned by the participants are affordable internet connection, and then uh, we have uh, poverty, and then at um, corruption in agriculture and food security and energy provision and price. Okay, so I insert them for ease of reference. So this issues validate the most pressing problems uh, being uh, faced by the Philippines today. Actually, the cost and quality of internet connection in the Philippines is one of the worst. I mean, in, in, in the Asia Pacific region. Let's say, for example, in terms of quality. The average speed is what is eight uh, Mbps. That's the global average. But the Philippines registered only what five Mbps. And in terms of uh, average average cost, um, well, in the Asia Pacific region, it's about what is five five dollars per um, Mbps. But for the, the Philippines, the average uh, cost is what is about eighteen eighteen dollars per per Mbps. So that's that's grave. Okay, so, okay, this is serious ramifications uh, for our growing um, information technology, uh, business processing, uh, management industry, and our services sector as a whole. Now, if we look at the results of the FGD, we also find that uh, most of the pressing problems um, select or mentioned by the survey participants also figured in the FGD. Uh, in particular, corruption and poverty also emerged in the FGDs. Okay? So, in terms of the pressing problems faced by ASEAN today in, in 2025, we can see there uh, uh, that the top five are of climate change, 
and natural disasters. Second is territorial disputes. Third is trade investment and regulatory coherence. Fourth is agriculture and uh, food security. And uh, fifth is corruption. So the climate change, uh, territorial disputes, and trade um, <laughs> trade issues figure in the top five reflector transnational character, which uh, require um, serious uh, regional uh, efforts by our ASEAN leaders. Um, well, when it comes to, uh, in terms of territorial and maritime disputes, the most immediate issue that comes to mind is the uh, conflict in the South, in the South China Sea. Actually, that was what most of the uh, participants mentioned during the action meetings. Um, on trade, investment, and re regulatory coherence, uh, remember that the business sector registered the lowest appreciation of uh, benefits of ASEAN membership, okay? Uh, I, I reported it earlier. And that could be related to the problems that the business sector is uh, currently experiencing. For instance, a recent paper offered by Dr. Medalia and uh, Melanie Mandarin uh, reported that um, many um, ASEAN member states are experiencing, are uh, heavily affected by uh, uh, non-trade uh, barriers no? in terms of their trading activities with other um, ASEAN countries, okay? Um, but um, the latest developments, as, as also reported by uh, Mr. Gay of the PFA, is some of these issues are being resolved gradually uh, by uh, our ASEAN leaders. In fact, um, it, um, during the recent summit, um, there were certain um, um, documents that were signed, such as the ASEAN Declaration on Climate Change, right? And there was also one on the protection of uh, migrant workers, which although did not appear here, in terms of migrant issues, is, is admittedly um, um, a critical issue as well for um, ASEAN as a whole. Now, um, in terms of uh, FGD results, um, we also found, uh, find that, okay, almost all of the same problems mentioned by the survey respondents also figure in the FGDs, okay? Okay, so let me just, um, I have, I was told I have only five minutes left, so I, I'll just uh, skip um, some slides anyway. I think a copy of this presentation will be uh, made available to, the, to all of you. Okay, so let me just go to the summary of the findings. Well, we found that Filipinos had moderate awareness of ASEAN. So for the respondents, Philippine membership of ASEAN is beneficial for the country, all with one, only moderate as well. We also found uh, the business sector's lukewarm attitude towards ASEAN and, what, and um, how it benefits uh, the Filipinos. That means the media has no coverage of ASEAN. Then, as I already mentioned, the most pressing problems being faced with the Philippines is ASEAN, okay? And this is one, one thing as well. In the eyes of the respondents, the ASEAN and also the um, FGD participants, uh, the ASEAN Secretariat should beef up its capacity in order to provide better service <coughs> to the ASEAN member states, ASEAN leaders, uh, to um, meet its objectives. Now. I, uh, I'd i like to uh, put forward some recommendations. Actually, these, these recommendations are not in the published paper. Uh, so these are my own recommendations. I, I, I'd like to be, uh, welcome any uh, suggestions or comments. So since we saw that uh, awareness and low appreciation are um, among the critical uh, issues that we have to address, this is really important to have more dynamic and targeted communication and outreach activities to increase appreciation and awareness of the association. So I listed there several um, things that we can do no? within the Philippines and also these recommendations are applicable to other ASEAN member states like increasing media coverage, partnering with professional media organizations, maximizing the use of social media, tapping student organizations, uh, continuing with, with activities for the youth, celebrating the ASEAN Day in public schools every year. Same as, you know, we, all, we have a UN Day, why not have a, an ASEAN Day as well. Considering making it mandatory to have the ASEAN flag in schools, public and private and government um, agencies, and it's encouraged the singing of the ASEAN anthem, the ASEAN Way in Schools and Government Offices. How many of us know that there is an ASEAN anthem? 
parang hindi masyado. Okay. The second one is maximizing school as avenues uh, for instilling awareness and appreciation of us. I think this is very important because if from small, our young people uh, know and understand and appreciate the importance of ASEAN, know that, that we will have a strong, active, and vibrant ASEAN community in the future. The situation in the Philippines actually requires immediate attention because the 2007 and 2014 surveys conducted by ISEA shows that the lowest knowledge about ASEAN was found among students in the Philippines followed by those in Singapore. Okay? So one of, um, one of the things that we can do to, uh, in, to tap schools is um, using school textbooks no, to educate our young people about ASEAN. In fact, the survey respondents and, uh, and the FGD participants think this is a very good idea and this was uh, validated during the surveys. So another is by encouraging the use of the ASEAN curriculum source book. There is merong, merong ganun, the ASEAN curriculum source book. So this is actually a recommendation that I call from the ICS book and it's worth enforcing. However, this is also worth determining by the ASEAN Secretary if indeed the source book is being used no? by our teachers and to what extent. And additionally, why not put up an ASEAN corner in every school and public library in the Philippines? So the photo that you see on the screen is a photo uh, of the Embassy of the Republic of Indonesia in Astana, Kazakhstan, uh, where they opened an ASEAN corner um, in a library, in a public library in Astana. Okay? So, as, as we have, uh, as we have uh, noticed, uh, with the Philippines Chairmanship of ASEAN this year, so there were various um, awareness campaigns that took place. Suddenly appeared actually, because these activities were not existent before. So, because before, occasionally we would hear about ASEAN in the news, particularly in government stations of, uh, you know, radio stations, uh, TV stations, no, but that's about it. Um, however, if uh, we are really serious, if the government is really serious about, um, about increasing uh, Filipinos' awareness and appreciation of ASEAN, then um, this awareness campaign should be made regular activities. This should go beyond 2017, no? And, um, and this should be the regular activities not just by government and schools, but also by local government units, okay? And local communities. And to achieve this, there should be concerted, um, a close coordination among the different entities of government for resource sharing and to synchronize efforts. Okay, and then lastly, uh, finally, to promote a more inclusive ASEAN, it's important, um, a more inclusive ASEAN where the voices of stakeholders are heard and, um, and considered in, in decision making, it is important to maximize the different platforms for civil society engagement and cooperation for business sector participation and, and youth engagement. So that's, uh, that's my presentation. So thank you very much again for bearing with my voice. And I would gladly uh, welcome any comments or suggestions during the open forum. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila. Uh, our next speaker uh, has been briefly introduced uh, earlier, an up-and-coming star <laughs> in economics. And um, I, I would like to mention that you won the economics at the Midland Marina. So if this is an international competition, right, joined by many prestigious uh, schools. So, and, and we wanted really to feature him in our, in our regional conferences. So, so read more about him in the profile, so please. So good morning, everyone. First, I'd like to thank uh, PASCN, PIDS, and especially Siliman University for inviting me to speak today. It's truly an honor. Uh, so this paper was presented by yours truly and Juan Hicho, also from the LSU. 
at the 14th Economics Global Economic Challenges held in Indonesia last year. And the theme of the said competition was on digital, uh, was on the digital economy, more specifically the dark sides of the digital economy, things that uh, problems and externalities that could arise from the concept of the digital economy. And today, I'd like to zero in on the problem of digital inequality, which is something typically overlooked when we look at the concept of inequality. Oftentimes, we look at near income or wealth. But I think it's important also to consider that there's also an inequality in terms of our technological capability as people. And maybe this may be a driving force of the skill spring that certain people may have over others. So, let me start. Okay, so first I'd like to give out some stylized facts. Some stylized facts. First, 9 out of 10 ASEAN countries experience high digital and income inequality uh, from the, uh, the, that source. And uh, currently, there's 35% smartphone penetration in ASEAN, but it's growing very rapidly. And uh, 2025, so uh, one of the majority of the ASEAN blueprints are centered on 2025. And a study by Kearney states that the ASEAN region as a whole has an opportunity to enter the top five digital economies in the world. That number, the 35%, so that was done in 2015. In 2017, it's already at 48%. So roughly one in two people in the ASEAN region now have a smartphone choice. Okay, so the motivation really behind the study was uh, we wanted to determine if there was a relationship between digital inequality and income inequality. And we wanted to try and see Cunningham's statement wherein, is this, uh, where, where he said that the digital gap is just as extreme and profound as the income gap in many countries around the world. So we know that there's a large wealth gap. Maybe it may have just, uh, maybe it's directly related to the digital gap that's in a country as well, okay? So the study seeks to one, determine the relationship between income inequality and digital inequality in the ASEAN 10, and two, recommend policies in compliance with the ASEAN Economic Blueprint 2025. The focus of the paper was on the second one because the competition was of, of policy. Okay, so uh, first we did a regression analysis and uh, this was the model specification. These are not the complete variables. We use various social demographic characteristics in a generalized least squares regression, random effects, panel data, of course. Uh, and uh, we determined random effects by literature and also by, uh, by the Hausmann test. Uh, so we found out that income inequality is negatively associated with the percentage of internet users. If there's a higher percentage of internet users, generally speaking, uh, there's lower income inequality in a country. Okay, at least in ASEAN. Uh, because of this relationship that we found, we would like to recommend the following policies. So this paper was done last year, and it's nice to know that the Duterte administration has been promptly doing majority of these policies, actually. So these are the three policies which we recommended in the competition. The first being software literacy, the second being accessible public Wi-Fi, and the third being the macro trade liberalization. So um, this, these policies are in chronological order, ideally, in terms of structure. So let's go through them one by one. The first is advancing software literacy through the implementation of the basic software education as part of the BEC. So uh, software literacy, it's defined very loosely by uh, people. So researchers say that it's the ability to process text documents, browse the web, and use basic applications. But this is very loose in its definition. There's no very formal way of defining it. Um, a lot of people believe that if we're software literate, it would increase productivity in the long run. Okay, so that, that's the main draw of it. And uh, currently in the Philippines and in ASEAN, there's a lack of ICT-related courses, uh, in public schools especially. There's very few in public schools. And uh, there's very few initiatives led by both the private and government towards development in education, particularly of these, of these ICT-related courses. And uh, currently, uh, there is very little rollout for technology-related subjects, but it is now in the revisions of the BECs of different countries. So, uh, actually, the landmark year was 2015, where a lot of the countries in the ASEAN were having the revisions for their curriculums. And, of course, uh, responding to a more digital age, a lot of them rolled out digital-based subjects. Uh, okay. So, 
uh, what are the main takeaways from the first policy? Number one is to catch up with modernization. So we live in a very modern world. It's just as prompt to be able to allow uh, and teach students to be able to catch up with that so that they can talk the trend. And then second is promote a knowledge-based economy so that uh, we would promote uh, more inclusive growth for the country. And lastly, this is in line with the ASEAN Economic Blueprint 2025. In the long run, it would be it would promote a more efficient and productive workforce that is knowledgeable in technology, thus make workers from the ASEAN more competent in the global landscape. So, particularly speaking, this policy was highlighted in the ASEAN Economic Blueprint 2025 as one of the needs that the ASEAN needs. Next is making public Wi-Fi accessible through a PPP. This was actually mentioned by President Duterte in SONA as one of actually the policies that he would want to implement. So uh, why a PPP? It's because uh, PPPs are extremely common in developing countries to kickstart various massive infrastructure projects, particularly to minimize risk of the public of the public sector's money and the private sector's money as well. And uh, the goal is to really increase infrastructure development for ICT initiatives, which is also again in line with the ASEAN Economic Blueprint 2025 as one of its central pillars. So uh, per Greenwood study and per other studies, the right way to implement this policy is through this way. Uh, starting first with middle income sectors by giving us a significant subsidy on some areas and then rolling it out gradually to be free as we go on and on uh, with the implementation of the policy. So uh, Wi-Fi is extremely important because the internet is considered as the biggest productivity gain even though there are detractors to that statement but certainly if accessible public Wi-Fi is uh, implemented uh, it would benefit our productivity. Uh, it's situated like this because based on Greenwood study, it is to minimize risk that may arise for starting with heavy subsidies to accommodate low-income households, given the structure of ASEAN communities around. The main takeaways from this policy are uh, these. First, it's a win-win-win situation for the government, private firms, and citizens of the country. For the government, we would be able to gain funds from external sources without having the need to increasingly increase taxes, yet implement programs that, to its, that its people need. For firms, it would be able to utilize and maximize their assets in a sustainable investment. And for citizens, it would be able to be, uh, they would be able to be more productive through more accessible Wi-Fi landscape around the country. Uh, so this is to ensure that our target demographic is uh, prioritized. Okay. So it, again, it's implemented through a, through a gradual rollout. Uh, so focusing on micro, before, and then we go to macro, we go to large scale as we go through. And again, this utilizes the knowledge gain from the first policy, chronological order again. So since people now are software literate, they'll be able to use the new infrastructure properly in a way that can make them more productive and more competitive. The third one, so the first two policies were generally micro policies and it's necessary for us to complement a micro policy with a macro policy and I'm very happy that this has actually been done by ASEAN formally because uh, they're now lowering ICT related costs uh, and it was actually recently discussed in the previous, in this concluded ASEAN summit. So the reason why this is needed is because in ASEAN there's a very high presence of taxes and fees for technological goods. And this has been prevalent, and this is one of the reasons why the digital gap is so severe in some countries, because of these high costs. And it makes uh, technological goods extremely unaffordable to people. Before, in 2012, where other countries were getting low prices for the basic smartphone, the Philippines' uh, cheapest smartphone back then was around 8,800 pesos. Now the cheapest smartphone that we have is barely one five. So that's the, the cost has gone down quite a bit, and it's because of the policies that have been situated for the ASEAN. Okay? Uh, the main takeaways from this is, number one, it would lower trade barriers, which would lower the prices of technological goods. So it doesn't necessarily hurt the firm that the, pri uh, the, uh, the prices of the technological goods would decrease. It's just that they don't need to pay for as much. And the consumers can purchase it at lower prices. But most importantly, according to Kearney, it can lessen the monopoly power of existing oligopolies and monopolies in the industry, particularly in technology we're in. Uh, it's uh, a lot of 
the things that provide us with internet, uh, with a lot of communication technologies, are extremely expensive. So allowing the lowering of costs allows more competition in this space. Uh, and really, that's about it. So the three policies, again, software literacy, accessible public Wi-Fi, and trade liberalization. All of these uh, must be done in order to be able to alleviate the problem of digital inequality. As we've said, digital inequality is also a big problem that we're now experiencing, and we hope that uh, in future iterations of TASI, we can re it. So with that, thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, I think now you know why we're still be cutting in here. And I think you have this, uh, he, 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 he serves as an inspiration to the young people around. Um, so it's time for um, open forum. OK, the first, se yeah, the first session, we have Sheila. Um,
So we sang it only up to August. <laughs> but, okay, at least we've been singing it uh, until August during the Ashen. No, my, my comment is with uh, Justino. This is more on uh, the digital gap. If you notice in the Banco Central, we've been conduct we conducted a research or study pertaining to the use of uh, uh, e-commerce, I mean the, the banking online, online banking. But we found out that only very few people are using the online banking. And uh, around 20% utilize or use that, the, uh, you know, buying online and etc. using credit card or debit card. So that is one of the issues. And indeed, uh, it was really true that uh, uh, the result of your of your research is really true because uh, Filipinos really are not yet uh, being literate enough on doing online uh, transactions using uh, uh, debit cards or even credit cards. Okay, that is what we are doing in the Banco Central that we need to address. But my comment upon you is this on one of the issues you presented is on the lack of ICT related courses. Now, uh, what is your source here? The global finance, because in the Philippines, if you notice in 2010, the Commission on Higher Education issued a moratorium for the offering of BSIT, considering that there are a lot of graduates of this course. So I, I, I wonder, but this is for Asia in the entire, but for the Philippines, I guess, we are exempted. Because uh, if you notice, the information technology courses are integrated across curriculum. And even if you notice, there are a lot of courses that are also taking up IT as part of their curriculum. So thank you for that. Yeah, uh, if you look at the specific average of it, uh, the Philippines bucks the trend. Uh, it's more of our neighbors that really don't offer as much. So the Philippines has had already a very wide rollout of ICT, particularly in, even in public schools and actually in various technical education programs. Malakas na yung Pilipinas for that. But when it comes to the average of the ASEAN, it's really bucked up by the other countries because uh, they focus more on the other areas. Maybe not much focus on ICT yet, but given they have a lot of corrupt, since we're all doing revisions for the BEC now, they have now included. So we're just waiting to see whether or not they can you know, hold up to that. But the Philippines is bucking the trend. I'm Gilbert Arbon of the Department of Science and Technology. Uh, this is for Mr. Eloviana. Uh, sir, I'm really, uh, I feel reassured and validated that what we have been planning or have been trying to do now uh, in trying to computerize uh, all the public elementary schools in the city is uh, sort of uh, very in line with what you've been recommending because uh, this project of ours involving the city, the deaf ed, and uh, from uh, abroad uh, civic clubs uh, seeks to ensure that our students, especially those uh, we have no access to computers, yes. to have access to computers. And the teachers also would be help along the way in trying to develop the courseware for that. So I'm really glad that uh, that's what you're recommending. But uh, when you said that uh, it's for software literacy, uh, do you also mean that uh, it, this includes uh, use of uh, technologies like uh, for microelectronics like Arduino and all that? Because these are also using software Software, although it's not really that software for geeks, but more of the can, but they're already, students are exposed to the kind of thing. So thank you for the question. With regards to software literacy, as I said, uh, the definition of it based on our study was very broad. There's no really one definition for software literacy, but based on the uh, curriculum revisions of the BEC, majority of the software literacy components of it would lie in more applied software and coding. So 
Uh, those are the two pillars of it. Applied software being mainly office applications as well as applications deemed necessary for maybe industrial applications as you progress through the years of education. Uh, on the more geek type of software, uh, uh, I did research on it a bit. It's more of offered electives rather than part of the curriculum itself. So uh, it's still it's still offered technically, but uh, the BEC on, on the countries that I've read on will focus on more applied software course. Okay, thank you so much. I think that's about the time we have. Uh, thank you so much for the questions and for the updates. And um, you know, if you have more questions, please email us. We, yeah. Please feel yeah. free, no? yeah. either to the PSN Secretariat or to the authors directly. But in the meantime, uh, I, I thank again our presenters. I, I, I think you agree with me that this has been very interesting, very um, educational, very informative. So please um, join me in applauding uh, Justine and Sheila. Uh, please come up here for um, the certificate. While while uh, while presenting, let me read. Let me read the what's on the <laughs> citation. So in recognition of your valuable contribution as speaker during the regional symposium on regional ASEAN and beyond ASEAN, the 50 opportunities and challenges for regional integration held on 20 November 2017 in line with PSCN's information dissemination program as the network's contribution to the Philippines chairmanship of the ASEAN 2017. Given this 20th day of November 2017 at the MBA presentation room, Siliman University in Maguete City, Philippines, signed by Dr. Lianto and uh, uh, Vice President Betsy Tan. So this one's for Sheila and another one's for So Justin. We move on to session two, and because our time time check now is 10:45, session two is supposed to start earlier than 10:45. But I just give a brief introduction to the two speakers. The first one who's going to give us the results of the quantitative tests for income level convergence in ASEAN countries. Actually, this is a paper that was to replace carbon emission, given that the second paper is already on disaster risk reduction, which is also for climate change. The paper presenter for this morning is Mr. Orlando Ronces Valles. He's currently a professor of Silliman University Department of Economics. Prior to joining Silliman, he was with the International Monetary Fund acting no less or working no less in the capacity of an assistant treasurer of the fund. A PhD economics graduate, a candidate rather at Brown University, he did graduate work in law and economics at George Mason University. He also finished Bachelor of Laws in Silliman University. So as I mentioned, he's going to present to us the quantitative test for income level convergence in Asian countries. A round of applause for Mr. Ronces Valles. The second speaker is the Dean of the Graduate School of Silliman University, who held the position prior to his acceptance of the Deanship. He was Director of the Research and Development Center of Silliman University. 
and also a director of the Philippine Higher Education Research Network, Silliman University. As uh, a noted researcher, he has published more than 40 researches, most of them in national journals. Here to present the result of his study on kinship network in reducing disaster risk in a collectivist culture, the Philippine case, friends may present Dr. Enrique Oracion. So pitch for a maximum of 20 minutes. Thank you.
I promise I will try to answer. If I can, if I don't have the answer, I, I will say nothing. But I will admit that I don't have an answer. Yes, ma'am. statistics and econometrics to ordinary human beings? That, that question? Fair enough. I'll try to answer that. Anyone else? That's a very good question, by the way. question, but I think there's a chart somewhere in the slides that will give, give an answer. Okay, I've got two questions at least to wake you guys up. I have why 
the empirical work. But after we did all the torturing we could do, the data doesn't want to talk to us. <laughs> a little bit, but you know, it's a little bit too quiet. So there, I think I, uh, I hope at the end of the lecture I have communicated or answered the, for the last question, how do you tell ordinary people like you about technical stuff? You have a handout, it has stuff in it, and we will try to, I'll try to make sense out of it for you as we go along. The background of the paper is the question, it's a little bit related to the second question, are the countries in the ASEAN and Asian region <coughs> converging? What does it mean to have convergence? Convergence means, well, let's say, maybe we can define convergence by the opposite. What is divergence? It's when the poor get poorer and the rich get richer. So what we want is the rich might get richer, but the poor get faster at getting richer and therefore the gap between the rich and the poor gets smaller. But the reality of life, un unfortunately, after you read all the books and all, do all the empirical tests, inequality is like a hard fact of life. The rich get richer because they're smarter and they have more money and they can buy technology and they can go to school. The poor get poorer because Unfortunately, they produce more babies. <laughs> and all of the data in this paper is all per capita income. We, that way we can compare the small country with the big country. And that's the background. The research problem is, well, <coughs> this is one of those things that we have to go to tech speak. We have something called a solo model. Who knows what a solo model looks like? Anybody? I'll ask one of the brilliant guys here. What is a solo model? <laughs> What's the basic kernel idea beneath solo? You grow because your capital grows and because your labor grows. Ideally, if you produce more babies, you will grow. But when we do the, that, that we do torture the data, you produce more babies, you don't grow. Ideally, you save more money, make more capital, you grow. That's solo model. And so what happens? We try to, to figure out how to apply solo model when we look at the per capita data that the World Bank collects. So now here we go. We find that, well, the data is sort of mixed. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. If you are interested in doing a paper on this, you have to read all of these papers. Uh, interestingly enough, just for personal interest, I can tell you I actually studied under Barrow when I was in my 20s. That time he was a young man in his 30s. The objective of the paper is to see whether there is convergence. In the literature review, well, I'm actually giving you exactly what is the meaning of convergence. The rich might get richer, but the poor get to catch up. When we test it, we have something called sigma and something called beta. If you're not interested, it's okay. I had a hard time figuring it out myself. And it's not that important. But I have to tell you what this is because I'm presenter. And there's something called absolute beta and there's something called conditional beta. Absolute beta is equation one. For those of you who are good at math, try to remember that. Conditional beta is equation two. The difference is there is this gamma in the middle with this big summation thing. If you understand that, good for you. <laughs> the findings, here we go. This is, this is now sigma convergence. What is being plotted is the simply the, the standard deviation, the variance across countries of per capita income. 
In the beginning, more or less everybody was poor, and the standard deviation across countries was not very high. The figures on the left-hand side are in thousands of US dollars, so you can see the standard deviation was less than $10,000 per year. It went up like crazy, up to 1985, but that's mainly because that includes a couple of oil exporting countries. I think you can see inside that, that list of countries that Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, the Oman, Qatar, they all made a lot of money because of the oil price hikes of the 1970s. So their per capita income went up, and we had not convergence, but divergence. The rich, the poor there became very rich. The rest stayed behind, so now you have a huge divergence instead of convergence. This is the actual data on per capita income levels. This is not diversion. It answers the question, ma'am. Philippines is green. And you can see the Philippines is, well, it's sort of in the middle. We're sort of doing okay, but not the greatest. <coughs> Similar data, not much different. East Asian countries, that does not include the Philippines, but you can see. A very interesting phenomenon. I think Macau uh, is making a lot of money because of gambling. You can see it there. And here, the green guy is Maldives, or Maldives. And do you know what they have? They have these beautiful postcards of islands in the middle of the deep blue sea, and the tourists pay a lot of money. Table one is what you see in the chart. This is, again, the standard deviation thing. You understand what standard deviation is, but for you, but it's not that important. And table two is the beta convergence estimated equations. You can see if you have a negative sign on log P, G, D, P, it's not so bad. And there's a little bit of support. We have tortured the data enough that it squeaks. Yes, there is convergence but not very strong. Now we go to conditional convergence. And the, con the conditional convergence story is a little bit like this. Convergence happens because there's something that makes countries grow. We don't know what it is, we do absolute beta. If we, but if we knew what it was, we could try to say, well, maybe it's because of technological change, trade openness, education, population growth. So we include all of these other guys. SSE is secondary school education. GCF is gross capital formation. GOV is government expenditure. POPG is population growth. What do we find? What happens is we still have the old beta convergence thing going on in model C. And, but we see that there's a nice effect. It produces people more babies you have divergence instead of convergence. So let's stop. I, I don't want to tell people to uh, not reduce babies. So the conclusion is we have empirical support, sort of, for convergence, but it's not very strong. And solo convergence sort of is there, but it's not, again, not very shaky. Policy conclusion, and here I have to do the humble economist story. We don't really know. Theoretically, all of these things we're doing for under a sale, opening up trade, trade liberalization, putting more emphasis on human capital, education, uh, being a little bit smarter about how we spend government money, that should allow people to get better. But again, theoretically, it does, I mean, at, at, at the fundamental level, and here I'm not speaking for a while, I speak for myself. If somebody gets rich, it's because it's being very smart. If the poor gets rich, 
He may be lucky because there's something else going on, which is a solo model. But usually what's happening, the rich are getting richer because of, they're the ones who have access to technology. The poor will try to catch up, but they don't have technology, and that's what that paper is of this young guy here. So therefore, you, you cannot see convergence. Or if it does happen, you have to get lucky. Something has to happen. And we don't know what that is. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning everyone. I think I'm more comfortable sitting here. Uh, I, I, I'd like to say first that I'm an anthropologist. So more I'm, I'm, not, I'm not therefore very good on numbers. I'm not very good on what usually economists are doing. But somehow, we have a field known as economic anthropology. Uh, my, my interest actually is in environmental anthropology. So you will notice that I'm, I'm with this topic, uh, Kinship Network in Reducing Disaster Risk in a Connectivist Culture. So first of all, let's look into uh, how disaster works. And uh, expectedly, uh, disaster could be natural or human-induced. And then, in terms of the sequence of the impact of uh, disaster, uh, I consider that one as principal and consequential. In other words, uh, there's a need for us to understand what is the source of the impact of disasters, so we could do something about it. And oftentimes, it's the consequence of the disaster that we measure the impact. But there's a very interesting anthropological question and this is somehow I put there in quotation. The stubbornness of disaster stricken uh, communities to leave, and they would rather remain in the place. And I found it very ironical because oftentimes the reason is it's where they're making a living. But it's also very dangerous. But why won't they not leave the place? So that, that's the point I would like to find out. And it's kinship that I'm going to look into at this time, the kinship network of these people. For one, in a collectivist culture like ours, 
close kinship is a major indicator. And in the Philippines, we have paternal and maternal kinship system. And oftentimes, it's the cause of problems with foreigners marrying Filipina women because they thought they're marrying only one, but actually they're marrying the whole village because all members of that village are related either by consanguinity or affinity. And so the foreigner would leave the Philippines, nothing. Just joking, right? Anyway. So the network of families promote cooperation, solidarity, and obviously survival, both theologically and socially. And this is an unwritten pact in a community. A collective consciousness, therefore, is being enhanced by kinship ties, and this becomes what we call a social security bond, a term in bar of economics. A social security bond in times of disaster. Now, Filipino culture as collectivist is evident in our, in our sense of belongingness. Uh, during relief distribution, for example, uh, when we have the Yolanda, Typhoon Yolanda. And oftentimes, it is a scarcity that is uh, a measure of how collective people are. But also, it's, this would show whom we are going to help. And usually, it is reduced to the closest relatives. So, closest means closest to blood relatives and away from relatives by affinity. So I'm going to use the case of the Palawan Batak and my recent study of a riverside community in Negros Oriental, particularly along Pagasan River. So this is the indigenous people in Palawan. I was involved in this project in 1983, and this was about, no, 1981 and published by Dr. Kadilina, the late Dr. Kadilina in 1985. So in 2015, I did my own study in a riverside community in, in uh, Negros Oriental. So this is Palawan, and this is Palawan, and that one is in, in uh, Negros Oriental. So in the study of Dr. Kadilina, he was looking into how inter-household food sharing among indigenous peoples work, particularly in times of scarcity. And take note that among Filipinos, it is always food that is commonly shared. In fact, this is could be seen also during fiesta. And November 25 or 24, 25, yeah. 25 would be the fiesta of Dumaguete. So perhaps people from Dumaguete would be inviting people from Manila. You can stay for a while. And there's always what they call a babaon, green house. Again, that's an illustration of how, you know, very close Filipinos are. But in fact, they are sharing the preparation of food. Now, food, as, as mentioned already, food is a common item shared with a mouth dictated by links. The closest, the farthest, well, that is determined by how much or how, how, how what's the volume of food being shared. But that community can show the authentic features of food sharing at the time that these were studied. So food sharing for them, and this is also found in economics, no? could be shared directly and indirectly. So food items, that is direct sharing. Information, labor, that's a form of indirect sharing. And the factors that affect sharing includes context of sharing, where, when, types of food being shared, and the family life cycle states. And then we have the kinship proximity and geographical distance. So these were measured by Dr. Adelinia, and I tried also to make use of this during my own study. So take note that family life cycle and this vary depending on who is the author, but he was using four stages. The first stage is a newly married couple. Stage two, with small children. Stage three, with more number of growing children, and some of them are married already. And stage four, couple of a band, advanced age without children. This, 
The first stage and the last stage, stage one and stage two, a four again, are considered as more, more susceptible or vulnerable to, to scarcity. Considering that one is still growing, another one is dissolving. So based on that, we look into how food sharing is being done. During period of abundance, and this is during harvest and post-harvest, sharing of food is very generous. Just like when you're happy, you love to share. But if you're angry, you, you keep it. No? And there is what we call diffuse distribution and the geographical distance open social repository of food for future use. Take note, indigenous peoples have no banks, refrigerator, and so on. So the only way you could deposit your food and use it in the future is through social networks. So by giving that out, so in times that you need it, you can get it back. So that's how it worked at that time when you did the study. So there is the widening of debt of gratitude. And this is something that could be withdrawn in the future. But during times of food scarcity, which is pre-harvest, generosity declines, but this varies uh, within the life cycle stages. Food giving reduces, and more receiving is experienced by household with high dependency. And uh, this is found in stage one and stage four. So in relation to disaster risk reduction, how is this possible? How could this be a strategy? But let's examine first our common notion about this disaster risk. So this is the formula. Disaster risk is a function of uh, hazards times exposure and the vulnerability of the household or the community. Considering that food scarcity is a survival, survival problem, therefore it's a major, major concern uh, during, uh, during uh, periods where there is drought in agricultural communities. So basically, agriculture cycle being so dependent upon the environment, upon nature, Typhoons and droughts made it worse. So it's not only pre-harvest or harvest, it's also the seasonality of production and the climatic condition. The success, therefore, is relative to the networks established during periods of food abundance. So our, the ability of households to have something in the future depends on how that household prepared for the future, that is by giving out. Closest kin and those living nearest the givers benefit more from food sharing. Kinship network, therefore, is basically a means for family survival in times of disaster where food is a priority. Now, how about this in rural Philippines? And so this is where I would now test that kind of model I learned from Dr. Cadillinia. This is, on a bar, uh, this is in Pagatban Riverside communities. And somehow it shows some similarities because the concern is full of scarcity, but during flooding, when there are strong typhoons and uh, heavy rains. There is a wide distribution of relatives in the community. And these are potential sources. So the given context that the village must have more or less Relatives, I mean, they have more relatives in that particular place for this to work. So the network of assistance is resorted to when external aids are limited or not promptly received. And this happened during Yolanda, when in fact there was a conflict between LGU and non-government organizations. Or there's a conflict about the pol politicalization of the distribution of relief goods. So this table showed, uh, shows how uh, relatives are distributed by consanguinity and affinity. 
In my study, I noticed there was only 15% of the 120 households that received assistance from kinship networks. But that's a good way already of measuring what I proposed earlier. So from this number of households, I look into how kinship assistance become a way of biological survival, as well as in the preservation of collectivist values. So there is, these are the common forms of assistance they experience. Money, food items, and labor, particularly for the repair of houses and boats damaged by the flood. Uh, this had helped the households recover, and this also provided them meanings to kinship network. So I hypothesized that they would not leave the place, but anyway, they could just go somewhere close to the area every time there would be a flood, and assistance would be available from neighboring households. And why is it possible? It is because the different sections of the river do not experience the same amount of damages. We compared, or I compared, upstream, midstream, and downstream sections. The midstream section was most vulnerable and experienced so much of the damage. The reason is that this was, or this is the choking point of the river. By the way, the river was connected to that mining company that was finally closed in 1979. If you could remember CDCP uh, or the Construction Development Corporation in the Philippines. And it was closed in 1979. But the mark of that company was the destruction of Pagatban River. The midsection is so much, so much silted now. And every time there would be a heavy rain, the water would overflow. And so that section, which I considered as a choke point, uh, made this community more vulnerable. And it also shows here that those relatives upstream or downstream could be a source of help. And also this shows that blood is thicker than water. And more nurturing stance of women or of mothers are seen when more of those maternal relatives provide help. And I think many of us have noticed that in the Philippines we are more matricentric. So I'm not saying uh, patriarch, pat patriarchal or matriarchal. We are matricentric. New co uh, couples, who, when, whenever they wanted to live separately, usually live closer to mothers. And there is an evolutionary explanation for that. Mothers usually help at times when the daughter to get pregnant and have a baby to raise. When, uh, similarly, when their uh, a daughter lives abroad, it's usually the mother, not the mother-in-law, but the mother of the daughter that's invited. So that's the explanation for that. Okay, uh, so I mentioned earlier that the mainstream households were more vulnerable to flash floods and overflow of water during typhoons that reach up to about a kilometer beyond the banks. So I also mentioned earlier that it was because of the copper mining company that operated in the area. So there is now a major physical alterations of the mountains of this river because of its technology, uh, which is open pit. And here are some of the anecdotal reports about the river. Before mining, it was deep, pristine, and abundant. After mining, it became shallow and <coughs> grayish due to siltation and sedimentation. And it turned the midsection to choke point. I mentioned that earlier. Now, without mining, uh, the, the water still rushed, uh, going up and, and beyond the river banks and into the farm. So, rust flooding is a major, major concern now. So these are the pictures who show that. The different section of the river. That's the open pit. So that, that is the scar left by that mine. And that's why perhaps many are against open pit mining technology now. 
that is the mined area abandoned, not rehabilitated, despite the promise of rehabilitation every mining operation. That's the river now. That's the mid section. That's not a road. That's a river. Before you would say, that's a road, not a river. Now this one is, that's a river, not a road. <laughs> the other way around, no? So imagine every time it would overflow. And so this is the upstream, midstream, downstream, and the historic. So that is the section that would experience more damage during flooding. <coughs> and uh, here the cost of the damage is shown. Uh, relative to the total damage, midstream 41%, upstream 40%, downstream 80%, and uh, always the, the damage is on uh, agricultural crops. So let me go now to the conclusion. But somehow I was able to show to you that kinship network is going to work among us Filipinos. Now I used the case of Batak in Palawan uh, for the study in 1985 to show that collectivism in, in, in a very compact culture still is going to work. Now humans cannot pre prevent natural hazards, but its consequence could be like food scarcity. Now, this could be, you know, overcome by food assistance from humanitarian groups, which often lead to more problem. And because this may not come on time due to the transport problem. So, in some cases, it's not enough to all affected households. So, there will be tension between the assisting groups and victims. And uh, the usual case is that this, how the relief goods are being distributed. But you know, there is what we call local support network. And this support network has kept them psychologically alive. And this also helped them uh, restore their sense of internal balance, which we call resiliency of these people, psychological resiliency. So therefore, this paper concludes that kinship assistance is first line of defense and this could be integrated in the DRRM program. It is more practical where collective consciousness is strong however, but this is not going to work in an urban setting if people are so diverse. It, it is in the context that there is a collectivist culture that this may work. And it's not only a cultural obligation now, it becomes also a resource. Resource to uh, adjust or cope to disaster. So the appreciation of kinship networking by DRRM experts would enhance disaster preparedness, generate immediate help, and harmonize distribution of external assistance. So kinship network could be the first line of defense whenever there is a disaster and external assistance may not yet arrive. Or when it arrives, it is not enough for all those who are affected. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Orishon. There you have it. There's actually a relationship between the first paper presented by Mr. Roses Valles and Dr. Orishon that after all, there is diversity in unity, or there is unity in diversity, whichever you want to take it. Because earlier we had quite a technical paper, and then we conclude with one that should be close to the hearts of everyone in the Philippines, because it gave us a factual account of what strong relationship can do in instances when calamities strike. So, this is time for question and answer. Either you choose the very technical paper or the one which I said should be very close to your hearts because each one is prominently represented in the kinship paper of Dr. Orashon. Questions, please? Yes, Attorney Arbon. Uh, 
Dr. Rosa Simonias. Uh, okay, sir. Um, my question is uh, with regard to the uh, solo model. I will admit I don't understand a lot about economics, but uh, from what you said, it's something to do with producing more babies. I would like to. <laughs> I'd like to ask, uh, what would be the impact, or if any, that the so-called gray population would have on this model? Like, uh, why are advanced countries encouraging more uh, couples to have more babies? And how, how would this affect this uh, model? Or are we poised to benefit from, from that? Yes. You're asking a, what's called a Japanese problem. <laughs> People get old, and Sorry. when they're older, like I'm a senior citizen, I'm no longer as productive as when I was young. So the rest of society, in theory, has to now support me. So the solo model is basically not refined enough to take care of the life cycle aspect. Because it basically just says output is a function of input, and the input is capital and labor. And the labor being looked at is productive labor. So, but the Philippines is a different case because we produce more babies than, than we have old people. And if we want the economy to be more productive, we have to reduce the number of babies. Because we don't have, we actually don't have as much senior citizens per million compared to Japan. But basically the solo model does not take this life cycle productivity into account. <laughs> no follow-up question? The answer is okay. <laughs> or do you have one to press for more? <laughs> <laughs> we have more babies. The problem to say is we measure per capita income, so the denominator is population. Yeah. So statistically, the more babies you have, the more people there are. And, yes. and if they're not productive, the per capita income goes down. And we're measuring convergence, divergence across countries. So uh, if I follow up, in the case of Singapore, they're also encouraging more uh, babies. Uh, would there be a point where if they don't attract migrants, uh, they feel less uh, rich? Course, yes, I think that's a Singapore problem. China is going to have that same problem very soon because at one point they had a one-child one, one policy. We don't have that problem, so we're okay. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> All right, we have room for one more question. Yes, uh, from, from BSP, okay. This, uh, this question goes to Please use the microphone. <coughs> Professor Rochester, this is a very practical question. What policy recommendations can you give, specifically to Banco Central, based on the results of the study? Uh, the study? Yes, yes. Policy recommendations, perhaps, for, for us? <laughs> Not only that, but uh, I, I'm very, I'm very, I'm not the solo model, but uh, perhaps the result, the, the overall result of the, of the study. I, I, I don't have an answer. <laughs> I mean, if I were Banco Central, my, uh, my duty is uh, how to control inflation, how to make sure the banks behave. <laughs> And I do not know if there is a dimension of uh, whether the higher level of per capita income in, say, the U.S. or Japan will affect how the central banks 
good deal of the economy. Um, I don't know. Sorry. Yes, because I guess if there is higher income, that will be a problem with the Banco Central. Because uh, if you look at the Banco Central's mandate is more on price stability. So if there is higher income for, for people, there is really a problem with us because we need to really balance the amount of money supply that we need to circulate in the economy. That's why I, I'm looking at that. Uh, if the income is higher, so people have money, so we need to look into that supply of money circulation in the circulating in the system. That's what we are, I'm trying to emphasize. That what particular policies can BSPD uh, adapting based on the results of the study? Because you look at this, the level of GDP per capita has statistically insignificant impact on the economic growth rate. And I'm even confused here. There is no significant relationship between GDP and economic growth rate. And, uh, Yeah, I, think, I think your question is very different. Um, it has to do with this catch-up effect. The regression equation says, kung you start out na mababa yung income, mas mataas yung future growth. Kasi you're starting from a low base. That's the idea behind the unmodified solo model. Kasi nga, you're very poor, Either you die or you grow. So you better grow fast. And so when we run the data and torture the data, we find that the lower the initial starting income of the country, the countries and data, the higher will be their future growth rate. That's all that statistical work is saying. Um, if An economy has more money, and then you have a central bank, and I, I think the central bank would be happy, it just has to make sure the inflation doesn't kick in. I mean, if there's money supply, there's also money demand. So if people demand more money because they're richer. They'll also supply more money because they're saving money and sticking it into the banks. But you still have to make sure that nobody misbehaves when it comes to inflating, or misbehaves in terms of stealing your money. So central bank will always have a job no matter what, yeah. so they're okay. So I don't, that's why I don't have a policy recommendation for them, they're happy. We are, we are, we are not actually happy, because as the economy grows. <coughs> our problem is the, the our, our capitalization, because the capitalization of Banco Central is only paying at 50 billion. And that's when, as the economy grows, we are going to absorb the excess supply of money. So we need to offer are different monetary tools that will actually we are the ones paying in the name of price stability. So that's why we are what a policy recommendation perhaps for the government really to, to extend uh, the capitalization of Banco Central. So we are initially uh, asking Congress to amend our charter from 50 billion to 200 billion. Okay, at this time I think uh, the president of PIDS can also provide us more significant inputs as regards to the question of the representative from this. <laughs> That's what you think. <laughs> you know, uh, models are models, and uh, Orlando will agree. If the model doesn't seek to explain what you want to understand, then the model cannot do it. And economists should be humble enough to accept the fact that you can't explain everything. It's because it's not explained in the model. It's always a very simplistic model. So from there, you go to the endogenous growth models. And if you look at the citations, many people try to cite several factors affecting growth. It could be technological change, it could be innovation, it could be what? So, mystery parinyan. Mystery parinyan. But From there, you can, you can have an idea of what really matters. So capital accumulation, better labor, investing in human capital. So that's it. You know, the central bank, it's not a model of risk There's no financial equation there or financial model. But certainly, the questions you raise are important. Now, by the way, will central banks have a future? Some economists think, with the advent of blockchain technology, there won't be a need for a central bank. 
But that's another seminar. <laughs> may bago, may bago ngayon na lumalabas ng technology. They call it blockchain technology. Giant ledger. No? Alam nyo, question sa naman. So, people are questioning, are we being becoming irrelevant because of these new technologies? Who knows? Sabi nga, there are many disruptive technologies coming to the picture which will just throw us off. Kasi hindi linear yung ano eh. And the problem with people sometimes they think it is nearly. But in reality, there are many imponderables. Kaya maganda yung, yung paper ni Dr. Horacion. No? Because it's, it brings us to the basics. Ano ba talaga? What really matters? No? So ganun pala ka-grounded yung, yung ito ko PRRM. I'm sorry, take it. Para na sana pa up na yung mga nag-uusap. Pero sinasabi niya, before you even look at those grand schemes, why not look at the very basic? This is what's happening on there. So anyway, in short, hindi namin alam. Simple, wala kasi, wala doon sa modelo. But we can model what you want to say. What was what was I was asking was the implication. Implication. Ganito yun eh. Okay, sabi ka niya, don't torture the data. Kasi huwag mong palabasin yung isang bagay na hindi lalabas doon. Kasi it's it's drawing, parang you're carrying it too far, at least from my point of view. And I, I critique one PIDS presentation the other week. Kasi searcher namin, ang dami sinasabi. Eh, isang equation na yung ginawa mo. Ang dami mo na sinabi. Ang dami mo na kwento. Implications. Even the implications sometimes, you have to be careful about drawing implications from a very simple result. But it's elegant. Sabi nga niya, the data is clean, the map is elegant, and the conclusions are possible. So, okay. It's a good paper. All right. Anyway, DSP is so busy with financial inclusion, strategy, your hands are tied with so many things to do with the national retail payment system. So, recommendations like what our speakers here said can, can make you even busier. So thank you, sir, for the participation. At this time, I request Dr. Urashon and Mr. Roxas Valdez to take center stage for the awarding of the certificate. And I'm requesting Dr. Yanto and Dr. Vidalia to please do the honors as I read the citation. Siliman University, Philippine Apex Study Center Network, Philippine Institute for Development Studies, award this certificate of appreciation to Mr. Orlando Ronces Valles in recognition of his valuable contribution as speaker during the regional symposium on Beyond ASEAN at 50 Opportunities and Challenges for Regional Integration held on 20 November 2017 in line with the ASEAN Information Dissemination Program and as the network's contribution to the Philippines Chairmanship of the ASEAN 2017. Given this 20th day of November 2017 at the MBA Presentation Group, Siliman University, Dumaguete City, Philippines. The certificate is signed by Gilberto Rianto, President of PIDS and lead convener of PASCN and Dr. Betsy Joy Bitan, Vice President for Academic Affairs at Siliman University. The same cert cert another certificate with the same citation is given to Dr. Enrique Ocho. Just a wave, or if you want to stand to stretch your legs, you may do so. 
So apart from the ones coming from Metro Manila, may I begin with the low cards. So we have from Foundation <coughs> University, Hazel Pigili, Zomer Tindam, and Pamela Puerto. We have a representative, actually the director of the Silliman University Government Affairs Center, Attorney Tabita Tinadan. The acting provincial accountant of the province of Negros Oriental, Ms. Dalia Kual. We're also fortunate to have one from the Department of Trade and Industry. She is Maribel Sumanoy. From the Department of Science and Technology, Attorney Gilbert Arbon. Also with us this morning is from the Negros Oriental State University, Benjamin Villagonzalo Jr. From the ASEAN College, the Dean herself, Ms. Hilda Eli. From the Philippine Ports Authority, Mr. Michael Monte. We also have from Accenture, Philippines, Dalil John Dubso. From the Bureau of Customs, Gina Fatima Lasola. Also with us this morning are from the Luz Auditorium College of Performing and Visual Arts, Ms. Glenis Casino. And from the SU RE News, Miselia Acedo. From IIE E, Negros Oriental, Engineer Jennifer Villanueva. From the University of San Carlos, representing Dr. Elizabeth Renetio, may I recognize Ms. Harold Canoy, all the way from Cebu. From the Colegio de Santa Catalina de Alejandria, the Dean of the College of Business and Economics, Mr. Gonzalo Bulaclat Jr. From St. Paul's University of Dumaguete, Ms. Christina Humawan. From Banco Central, you've heard Mr. Gregorio Bacay III. From the, uh, from the Development Bank of the Philippines, with us is the manager, Ms. Arlene Navarro. From the Bureau of Immigration, Ms. Chrysler Lee Vivian. And another one from BSP, Mr. Florencio Flores. From the Department of Foreign Affairs in Dumaguete, my boss, Mr. Reynold Banda. We also have from SPI Healthcare, Ms. Crystal Joy Ozoa. From Jollibee Foods Corporation, Ms. Rosel Bolanis. Hello, hindi tayo nililig ko eh. Here to attend, okay. And from Zwilig Pharma Corporation, Mr. Kenneth James Morados. May I request the MBA students who are here, those who came in, towards the latter part to listen to the papers, please rise. We have Ms. Patron, Ms. Torres, Ms. Lovato, Ms. Renata, and Castanianes. Now, if I miss out on the locals, bear with me. But this is really a day where we could not uh, essentially talk about who we are, but what we can do in line with what PIDS and PASCN have been doing all these years, and that's bring to us the importance of ASEAN. So 
for, for the PASCN and the PIDS contingent. Can you please stand? A big round of applause for them. Thank you very much. Now I will call for his closing remarks. opportunity to conduct a regional forum here and uh, let me thank everyone also for their participation uh, also uh, I wish to congratulate the speakers and the presenters for their interesting and the forward-looking research I have been given the challenging task of summarizing the studies and presented today and give some closing remarks I find this task challenging because I need to keep everyone's attention on the topic and away from lunch, especially that we heard Charlie P. <laughs> uh, Alright, so let me try to use the words of Singaporean Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong when he received the symbolic gavel from Philippine President Duterte, signaling the end of Philippine hosting and the beginning of the Singaporean hosting of ASEAN. And I quote, um, we can find new ways to manage and harness digital technologies and equip our citizens with skills and capabilities and keep ASEAN a vibrant and dynamic place of our peoples to live, work, and play. Prime Minister Lee's words touch on the topics discussed by the papers. Finding new ways to manage and harness digital technologies touched on Justin's paper on technological inequality, where we heard from Justin three policy recommendations that are 
very much relevant for the Philippines. So promoting software literacy, increasing access to public Wi-Fi, and uh, reducing the cost of technological uh, imports through trade liberalization. Equipping, equipping our citizens touches on Dr. Shiar's presentation as we are all citizens of ASEAN. We heard from her the need to increase awareness of ASEAN in the Philippines, but this is not only true for the Philippines, but it's also true for a number of ASEAN countries. There is a need to increase awareness that we are all ASEAN citizens and not just citizens of our country. <coughs> Equipping citizens with skills and capabilities touches on Mr. Orlando Roncesvalles' presentation. Because in his presentation, we learned about income convergence and population growth. It is not just a matter of increasing the population, although Solu's model says that. But we know that it's the quality of the population that we need to improve and increase. That is why we need to equip our population with the right skills and the right capabilities. Finally, keeping ASEAN a vibrant and dynamic place of our people to live, work, and play touches on Dr. Oroshan's paper, which highlights the importance of networks of families in addressing disasters and risks. Because after all, we, rec we rely on our families. And if we see ASEAN as part, if we see ourselves as part of the ASEAN family, then we, are, we can actually rely on this family to mitigate the risk of climate change and disaster. So what can we learn from this? So this, this is significant because our forum has already touched on what the future host of ASEAN, which is Singapore, wants to talk about in the following year, which is innovation and resilience. And because our topic today is ASEAN at 50, opportunities and challenges, we now learn about opportunities that can be brought about by innovation and challenges that can be brought about by disasters and climate change, and how we can resist them. So that's my summary. So now let me go to the closing remarks, which will, I'll, be, I'll keep very short. Because we see from this presentation the value of PACN and the work and their work in terms of arranging such a forum, which brings together stakeholders and researchers from different parts of the Philippines. I am very much pleased to hear research from Siliman University and also the research from BIDS and from De La Salle University. And we hear important comments and um, points of view from other stakeholders. So this activity by BASCN is very much appreciated. And uh, the value of disseminating information is very much appreciated. And since I mentioned information dissemination, let me now make a shameless plug. There is a PIDS corner here at Siliman University. It is located at the main library. It was inaugurated in 2007. So I hope uh, the participants and the students can also visit the PIDS corner. And I hope you find our studies uh, relevant to your studies and to the work that you do. Also, Siliman University is a member of the Socioeconomic Research Portal. So if you, for the Philippines, so serve people. If you go to PIDS website and you click on SERP, you will see there a list, not many, but there's a list, of studies from Siliman University and also from PIDS. So we try to make available 
as long as it's a digital copy. Studies that are made by Philippine researchers to everyone. So it's free, the access is free. So students, researchers, policy makers can actually find value in the information and the research that PIDS tries to put on the web and tries to make available to everyone. So my note, my notes end there. So I, I actually don't have anything more to say. So I guess uh, let me take this opportunity to once again thank Silliman University. Uh, we we can see here the back the the network and the linkage that PIDS has already made with Silliman University, and I hope we can continue with the collaborative work through BNS. Thank you very much. All right, that ends our program. But like what I said, let's have the